Um, I'd like to introduce Matthew Stanton, um, who's made this work here. So Matthew has come up from Melbourne. Um, maybe Matthew, you can talk a little bit about your Queensland growing up and history uh, first. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'd just first would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of this um, amazing landscape, which I've probably not visited since I was quite young, the um, Gubby and Jinnabara people. And, uh, just also like to acknowledge that my life and work as an uh, artist within the Australian landscape from the deep north of Queensland down to Victoria has on some levels been made possible as a result of history's violence. And I just wanted to acknowledge that side of what I do in working in landscapes that are, and never were in many cases wilderness. Um, they were always occupied, um, intimately understood, and in many cases intensively managed by you know, uh, the, the First Nations people who occupy the same firm. So, so just wanted to acknowledge that first. Um, I, um, I grew up, I was born in Brisbane, but I, uh, my father, who was a, um, an ecologist, a field ecologist, um, uh, was transferred to far north Queensland when I was about three years of age. We were, we were I was actually, um, lived at Victoria Point, Bunker Road, uh, which is uh, so it was sort of totally undeveloped area when we lived there, or largely undeveloped. And, um, so I sort of grew up in the bush as a little kid. Um, it's a big sort of property that Dad was working on uh, regenerating. Uh, then we moved to far north Queensland around 79 and moved to a place called, um, in a Jabbagai country, um, uh, which is often known as uh, Crystal Cascades, uh, sort of the, um, it's a very important place for the, uh, the Jabagai and the Adinji people, who are the traditional owners of that land. And it was um, essentially a, a valley that was, it was essentially all uh, sugarcane farms all the way down the valley. It's a little single lane road. Uh, there was a creek that wound its course all the way down that kilometre stretch of the valley. Um, and there would have been a few houses out there, farming houses, etc. And it was this sort of a, I mean, as a child, it was, uh, it was a pretty remarkable upbringing uh, in retrospect because when we were really brought up, we just took off. Um, you know, we, we just uh, disappeared in the morning and just explored the landscape um, intimately and thoroughly. We knew every sort of corner of the creek. We knew where all of the tributaries were. We knew what it was like to walk up the tri tributaries and what lay up there. And we sort of just decided to take off uh, I'm going to walk over that back hill and see what's there, and I'll be back at some point. Um, and we just sort of pack a few sandwiches and disappear. So it was a fascinating landscape to grow up in, and I sort of grew up with uh, a whole lot of, I guess, really heady political um, uh, situations playing out. Uh, Dad was um, initially a senior scientist for the Queensland National Parks and Wildlife Service, but he was also um, uh, eventually uh, asked to take on the position of regional director at the time that um, uh, Joe Bianca Peterson, Martin Tenney, who I think was a member for the region, uh, were trying to push through the Cape Tribulation of the Daintree Road. So I sort of grew up with a whole lot of really um, disturbing stuff going on that Dad was trying to navigate um, and, you know, he'd previously done a lot of work to uh, ensure that the Daintree and Cape Tribulation were, project were protected back in the 70s. A lot of field reports and um, made a very strong case for them not being opened up for development, which are about, was about to happen at that point. You know, that it was just inching further and further towards Cape Tribulation, uh, dairy pastures in many cases. So I sort of grew up with this sort of um, the political climate of Queensland in the background, this very direct relationship to the landscape, intimate relationship with the landscape, where I felt you know, the, the way the landscape changed, the different textures of the landscape, the different um, transitions from rainforest to wet sclerophyll forest to, um, you know, rep riparian uh, sort of uh, alluvial rainforest. They all had their own character and signature, which I was very conscious of. I was familiar with those changes and I could sense them, but I didn't really have a vocabulary for them until I got older. So it was a, yeah, it was a complex time where I, I think I absorbed a lot but didn't really realise how much I was soaking up until I got older and started working with the landscape as a photographer and realised 
there were things that I wanted to understand and, and needed to sort of delve into that I hadn't actually properly addressed. And um, so that's when a lot of the work I do now really sprung from. It began back in the late late noughties, essentially photographing the landscape of my childhood with a large format camera, uh, an 8x10 inch view camera. And um, the more I looked, the more I realised I'd taken a lot of things for granted and had been complacent about what I understood. Um, sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, we'll move on from there quickly, but uh, um, you, you did talk in your, your talk about people's view of the land and how, without that knowledge, you know, I think you talked about uh, landscape being uh, opened up by cyclones or human mm. destruction and then all this stuff growing in the landscape and people go, wow, that's an amazing landscape without knowing that history. Yeah, and that was the sort of thing I realised I was asceticising uh, a, a landscape that was essentially uh, attritional landscapes in many cases. You know, I was seeing these incredible um, dense fields of smothering vines, um, marimia vine and lawyer vine that were just draped over the canopies of these rainforests. And I think that was actually where something clicked for me and I realised that I needed to look more deeply, I needed to ask a lot more questions. And it couldn't just be about sort of trying to evoke a psychological response, you know, even though you know, I could sort of mine that terrain for quite a long time. Given the opportunity, I realised I needed to understand what lay behind those patterns that were compelling, but also um, unsettling in many cases. So, uh, for instance, uh, a good example of this is uh, down near Babinda, there's Babinda boulders. It's quite a, um, uh, a significant place uh, on a number of levels, and it was very intensively logged uh, probably around mid last century, uh, they went in. There's a famous photograph, well, famous, famous for me, uh, by ecologist Len Webb, and, um, who was one of the early people doing conservation work in the area. Of all of these forests had been logged completely. The canopy was opened up, and you know, there's a lot of sugarcane fires happening. They were trickling into the understory of this dried out forest, and um, you know, so fires were burning all throughout those areas, and it was just. Um, it was a really uh, unsettling image of a, what would have been really complex lowland rainforest uh, prior to that, you know, early previous century. Um, and 50 years on, I was there, and essentially what happens in that environment is that when the canopy is opened up, um, it makes rainforests, in particular after logging, much more susceptible to damage by strong winds. So cyclones would come through, and essentially, where the forest was buffered by its own density, the cyclones were now able to uh, virtually clear fell large parts of the forest just because there was no protection. Once that happened, uh, these, these vines that always uh, sort of pop up when there's been sort of significant trauma or disturbance were able to scale the canopy and drape themselves over the existing trees. So you ended up with this kind of landscape of a, a blanketed uh, field of vines that look quite beautiful. It reminded me of that, uh, was it Cus Cusa uh, in Florida? That's, I can't remember what it's called now, but that vine that's all over Florida. Well, these are native vines, which is the thing. People assume, well, they've got to be invasive, but they were native vines. But the balance of the landscape had been so disrupted that they now basically, um, you know, vied for the dominance of the canopy and all of the other trees were essentially starved of light and gradually pulled down. So people will drive through the area and go, well, look at this beautiful lush green. I had a print, one of my most popular prints was, you know, and I, I like the print too, I think it looks, I, I like it aesthetically and visually, um, but it was really a response to this is incredible, beautiful, um, relatively pristine uh, tropical uh, landscapes that were being depicted and often they were far from it. They were the, um, you know, a, a result of a succession of attritional processes. I mean, it's interesting that uh, when Matthew does talk about this, you know, that scientific knowledge really, it really struck me when we did the interview, but even now, when we're at home and we're chatting, if there's a very strong scientific knowledge of the land. Um, I guess one other thing, and then, then I started thinking myself, you know, well, what about the artwork? You know, what about, what, where does the artwork come in? What, what, how do you look at that artwork? And as Matthew was just talking, this notion, the way people see those images, like this beautiful landscape, 
when there's so much else happening inside. It was something that you talked about, about when you photograph the landscape, how you photograph from the edges, and you know, do you photograph from the edge, do you photograph inside? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, just yeah. that notion of that, before we get back onto this place. Well, look, it's, it's much easier to photograph from the edge, because you're looking, initially I was really preoccupied with surfaces, the surfaces of the forest, and usually those surfaces can only are only accessible because the landscape has been opened up. So you're in a position where you can see far enough beyond where you are to actually frame up uh, a, a sort of a scene or a surface in, and compose it in a way that will result in an image that's pictorially pleasing in some way. Um, so often I would, um, yeah, I, I would basically work from the edges of disturbed forest and try to find positions where I could either access the canopy or the, the forest that, you know, maybe bore traces of human activity and human disturbance, or what was much more difficult was trying to go anywhere where I could actually find a surface of forest that actually represented, you know, I don't want to say virgin forest, because that's not really, doesn't really feel appropriate, um, uh, but a whole growth forest that hasn't been disturbed uh, by extractive activity. Um, and very, very hard to find that sort of a view of that sort of surface without getting up in a, you know, helicopter or a drone. I didn't want to work that way. So I guess, yeah, usually the fact that I can photograph these landscapes at all is because they've been uh, seriously modified and disrupted, and I can now locate myself within the landscape with, the, you know, a, a so-called ecological gaze um, uh, towards the landscape. Uh, but, you know, once again, it's only as a result of the despoilation of the landscape that I can do that. Okay, so we've got an installation here and it's composed of a, a range of things, maps, of close-ups, of all those, uh, you know, geological species, you know, set out like, you know, scientifically, um, you know, old, old maps, old, very old maps of of the landscape and obviously works within the forest. Um, this is landscape is on the property that, that I live on. Um, maybe what we could just initially talk about, because I, I mentioned it earlier in the talk about W.D. Francis, the botanist um, who lived in this area, you know, the family owned that, this our property and the property next door and the one on the other side. Um, he actually did do a lot of work documenting the trees on the property before, you know, and he was living during a time where things were being cleared as well. And, you know, it wasn't like he was fighting, I don't know, he might have been, I don't know his internal views, but um, he might have been fighting that logging. But certainly he used a lot of the original old growth forests in the property to document. Um, and I think Matthew's done a bit more research. So maybe Matthew, you could talk a little bit about um, your connection to the property through your father but also just how you went about understanding the land there. Yeah, sure. Um, well, look, I was aware of W.D. Francis' um, dad that, you know, often given me books to look at when I was younger, which I probably didn't pay anywhere near as much attention to as I retrospectively wished I had. Um, but uh, my father's uh, closest friend was a, quite a um, significant uh, rainforest ecologist by the name of Jeff Tracy, who worked with Leonard Webb in the CSIRO Rainforest Ecology Unit. Um, and prior to that, with the, um, it was called the Australian Phytochemical Survey, and they, their job was to go out into the rainforest, working with foresters a lot of the time, um, and people who are in the process of clearing the landscape, and trying to get knowledge from them about where certain trees were that might have certain phytochemicals that could be used for medicine. It was a big survey, it went for a very long time. It was in conjunction with, I think, an American university as well. Um, and throughout that process, um, I guess they came into contact with a lot of significant government uh, botanical figures of herbariums, etc. So Jeff in particular, uh, who was my father's mentor, had, was in a way a successor to W.D. Francis and was very strongly influenced by his work because there was nothing else like what Francis had done in terms of that book. It was remarkable, the, the research and the scholarship that had gone into it. Admittedly, in tandem with the wholesale tearing up of the landscape that in his own family property. And so there's this sort of 
um, you know, kind of dichotomy there where this ecological interest is developing alongside the, um, uh, this kind of really uh, rapid extraction of natural resources from the landscape. So I guess there's that influence of W.D. Francis sort of followed on as, you know, in terms of ecological mentorship and the history of that um, uh, scholarly sort of engagement with rainforest botany was sort of transmitted uh, to my father who met Jeff um, when my father was still working in forestry in the early 60s. So I guess um, it's, it's a sort of, uh, whilst I don't, I didn't intimately know of his history, I was aware that there was a, a family association and touchstone that, or some sort of a lineage there. And I felt like it was important for me to engage with that when Kevin got in touch. I felt like I needed to understand more about this relationship between um, these, uh, you know, I guess processes and activities that were destroying the landscape and the emergence of ecologic and ecological consciousness uh, alongside that, um, and people came out of those fields and moved into very different fields because they spent a lot of time in the landscape and they saw what was happening to it, and they realised there wasn't a lot of time left to actually stop some of the remaining intact areas from being destroyed and, um, and cleared. So uh, that, that's part of it, I guess. So maybe what we should do is maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the works and how they work together the data that you've got available for people as well. Yeah, sure. Well, look, I started, the whole thing that I started with, with this project when Kevin got in touch was because because I grew up with aerial photographs. Uh, Dad was doing vegetation mapping for the wet, he mapped the wet tropics bioregion. He'd been mapping with stereoscopes ever since I was very little. So I grew up with these 10 by 10 inch aerial photographs printed off large sheets of film, contact prints. And you could look at them under the stereoscope and the landscape would just come alive. You'd get all of the depth. You could interpret the landscape in ways that you couldn't possibly just with a single image and because of very, very high magnification as well. So I kind of grew up with this relationship between, uh, I guess what you call the God's eye view, um, you know, which is problematic on a number of levels, uh, but also with ground truthing of what you saw. So there's, because the, the process of vegetation mapping is you, you learn to understand and recognise the different patterns within the landscape and what they represent, you know, their intactness or degree of disturbance, what kind of forest it is, whether it's, um, you know, rainforest, sclerophyll, wet sclerophyll, what the understory is like. You can interpret those things from these, if you've got the right pair of photographs. I, um, so the first thing I really did was I got, tried to get the maximum um, resolution image of the property uh, that I could get my hands on. So that involved, I think it was going on to QImage or the Queensland Globe, and taking about 177 screenshots of all the different sections of the property, because they were quite small sections of the property, uh, saving with my computer, then stitching them all together into a five gigabyte file. <laughs> so I could then have a look at what this place looked like. And I, so I, was, I started with the God's Eye View and, and just scratching my head and wondering what things were. And the thing that fascinated me most, most was this huge clearing here. I was like, what the hell is that? Like, I thought, was it a swamp? Was it a, um, you know, was it a crop of something? You know, was it, you know? <laughs> um, and I, so I, um, I thought, I, I want to get up to there. I was asking Kevin and Simone about that. And I said, I really want to see what this is. And it was sort of, that, that came out of a childhood of, you know, just wanting to take off and discover something that I had an inkling might be interesting. So I, I then got in touch with my father and I sent, I, I found a stereo pair of, um, uh, aerial photographs from uh, 1958. Th these were taken by the lands department, these photos, or they, that was their um, project. And they were using them, of course, in order to figure out what landscapes could be best uh, developed and, and converted into, you know, the Brigalow, which two million hectares of Brigalow was wiped out within about 15 years in the 60s and early 70s, you know. All of these sorts of photographs were used. They would just drew lines over the landscape and designed these random blocks without even thinking about what the terrain was a lot of the time and carved it up and just handed it out to people. Um, so these, these maps themselves have a history of, you know, a hegemonic sort of um, extractive uh, ideology in many ways, but they're also then used by ecologists who learned how to use um, stereoscopy uh, to then interpret vegetation and make a case for the protection. But you had to then ground truth it to know what it actually was. You had to go onto the ground and look closely and go, 
well, is, what, is this what I think it is? Are these boundaries, do they represent what I, what I think they are? So I wanted to know the history and the overlay, the, the different concentric kind of layers of history and disturbance in the property. And I had two things that I could, uh, I guess, uh, refer back to. One was this image here, and Dad, I sent Dad the images, and he got his stereoscope, and he marked them up based on his best possible guess, based on the fact that the landscape had been very heavily um, cleared. Uh, so the, all of the information of his interpretation of those color codes on this map and this map here uh, in, in that basket, and they're laminated. So once we'd done that, um, I, I guess I started thinking about, well, I need to ground truth this landscape. I need to be on the ground and I need to go as far away as possible from the God's eye view and almost look at the landscape like, a, like it did when I was a child as well and just look at, obviously pay attention to the ecosystems and the vegetation um, communities and structures. But also I wanted to just look very closely and I guess find a um, counterpoint to that way of looking at the landscape that was very much about looking at um, the minutia and also looking at encounters with things that were, um, you know, that had a sort of a primacy uh, which felt important. So I, I essentially traversed the landscape, I, I walked along the creek in a number of areas and then finally I committed to walking up to this patch up here. And I've, I've been very influenced by the, um, the filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky in my work. I'm not sure if people know his work, but this idea of the zone in his film Stalker is something that always sort of lurked in the background when I'm photographing in particularly landscapes that have suffered some sort of cataclysm in many cases in terms of what happened, like at the Appleton Tablelands and the lowlands of uh, the wet tropics and the, the lowland rainforests of Kinkin as well, which were cleared, you know, largely completely cleared by about, what, 1925 or 1930. Um, so there's also this sort of sense that there's these hidden forces at play, there's these processes um, that, are, that are taking place and you need to sort of tread carefully and be pliant and attentive to the landscape. So I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be um, uh, trying to just get to know the landscape through, I only had two days, through just as, I'll choose one walk, um, which I ended up doing two times, uh, a bit further the second time, and just try to get, understand what I can through that walk. So essentially we, we took the, walk the creek here and here on the first day, and we took the buggy up as far as this old logging track goes, and then I sort of cut down the embankment and walked along the creek, uh, as far as I could on the first day. And, um, I encountered this huge kind of um, philite uh, precipice that I just couldn't get up. I was just staring at it. I had my camera gear, like tripod and camera. I'd already fallen over and nearly broken one of my cameras and bent the back on it. And I think I probably shouldn't be taking that many photos. I think I should just concentrate on, you know, saving my neck and my gear. Um, and uh, so I went up there, I, I took a number of uh, visual notes, um, then came back all the more determined to get up there the next day. And I told Kevin and Simone, I said, there's got to be a way up there. Um, just cut me short if I'm going on too yeah, long. We walk with you to, to yes, the next day. Too, we yeah, I, I took them up and, um, and Kevin, Kevin had, a, had a go with me at getting up to the side. I thought, well, if I cut up the edge, because I was sure that the track had originally gone through there, but it was so overgrown in so many areas, you couldn't really even discern it. So I just cut up. Um, the side of the, the, the hill up here and located what looked like an old, an old track around the side that it had sort of fallen, the hillside had fallen down in places and you couldn't pass it but I kind of got beyond that. And I kind of walked around to here and it's really remarkable up here. There's this sort of, um, there's lots of, you know, figs, like I think ficus oblique. Um, but then you get this amazing, it's very shallow, um, slow flowing uh, creek where it flattens out. And it's just this amazing corridor of pica bean palms. Like, and it's one of the most beautiful groves of, of, of that sort of variety that I've ever seen. I was just absolutely gobsmacked. And I, I walked through it and I was expecting to see something kind of beautiful. And it kind of was, but also, of course, when you know what Lantana is, 
you realize that it's not really that beautiful <laughs> at all. It was this beautiful, you know, that's it there, that green field. This whole clearing, which was, was completely occupied by the densest land tanner you've ever seen. And um, the creek just, I was hoping to walk to the source of the creek, that was my plan, but the creek was just um, running through this tunnel of lantana that went right down to the ground and I couldn't get beyond it. All I could do was stand there and take some photographs of the lantana and sort of, I took, dug into the soil to look at the soil and it was this really beautiful, friable, deep red rich soil. And I thought, well, what's, what happened here? What, what took place for this to be the outcome? And interrupt whenever you're ready for it. Um, so we, Simone actually did some wonderful research um, and I, I got in touch with um, my father who works with the Australian Wildlife Conservancy now down, and has done a lot of work at Curramore Sanctuary down at Mullaney with them in terms of regenerating the landscape and what they found is that um, a lot of these patches were places where they'd grown had banana plantations because they were high up, uh, less susceptible to frost up there but also often on soil that rainforest would have initially stood on, which is usually, not always, but often the most fertile soils. So this was a depression up in the mountains where all of this sort of soil and organic material had slowly gathered over millions of years, and it proved to be the perfect place for, it, probably, it would have already been cleared for something else, I, I think, before then, for timber. Uh, they would have taken all the big timber out well before then, based on these pictures here. You can see the clearing there, and there's, there's very little vegetation cover. A bigger part? What kind of timber do you think there was? Oh, look, there would have been, um, well, on the deeper soils, there probably would have been red cedar and stuff in, in, in those areas with the deeper soils. Um, like along the rocky sort of um, colluvial slopes, uh, maybe down low, there would have been similar stuff. Um, not sure whether the, um, the oricaria would have been up there. It's hard to know, but it would have definitely been rainforest in that section. Um, and you can see it's supporting regenerating rainforest. You can see the very significant difference in the structure of the canopy with the regenerating rainforest compared to the eucalypt canopy in these images. And um, so, yeah, it turns out they probably had, there's a whole patch of similar things all over the property up here, clearings that are just filled with lantana. And it's not to assume that they were all banana plantations or even hard to be completely certain that that was, but on Curramore, uh, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy property, uh, that they, they did research into the history and found out that that's what they were and had to go to great lengths to try to get rid of it and then regenerate it, uh, replant it with rainforest species. Yeah. And basically the property next door, there are um, remnants of, you know, what, what did you call it? Flying fox. Flying fox. Yeah, I was just saying, right. yeah, where they yeah, it was a wire. Yeah. Just they flew down on the wire, really. Yeah. Like they would yeah. just go at great speeds hurtling down, yeah. like for kilometres. Yeah. 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 After your visit, um, and then we had a lady who was doing some Right. Oh, okay. So it would have been bananas most likely then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to make an aside to um, connect with another um, interview and talk that we had in the Traverse, which was with a surveyor, and it was quite interesting talking to him about how they marked up the maps, early maps, compared to what they mark, how they mark up plots now and lots now. And just this particular image, the, the blue image here, it's quite a work of art in its own right. Because he told, talked to me about the notion that in the old days you could actually mark up kind of where things were by talking about a feature of the landscape, you know, this certain group of trees or this certain kind of natural pathway, etc., etc. And if you look at that beautiful little map there, um, it's all these incredible little descriptions. And whereas now what we do is we just make these very straight scientific maps with no kind of you know, mm. human kind of interference whatsoever. Was Matthew overwhelmed you with these <laughs> deep scientific maps? Did you talk Matthew about those rocks and how? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, so just quickly to give you a sense of what I've done here um, in, in this map and these two images. Um, 
this is um, these are the different uh, vegetation communities that I sort of I marked up by the boundaries um, at really high resolution. Didn't necessarily know what they all were, but I knew that they were transitions. Uh, and then I sent them through to my dad and had a chat with them. I marked up speculatively what I thought they were, and he confirmed that that seemed to be what most of them were, even though we didn't know what the specific trees dominant in the canopy were, except for where I walked through. I mean, you knew there's like um, Queensland box and some iron barks and tallow woods around up higher on the ridges. Um, so the code for this, all of these color codes for all of the different lines and delineations are on um, uh, eliminated sheet there for both maps. Uh, these images here, I was, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a pretty crap, crap scientist. I'm not, you know, I, I'm the son and brother of, of ecologists and scientists, but I, you know, I only know so much and I know, I know what I don't know and I know that I can ask them if I'm confused and that's been a great help because I get pretty bamboozled sometimes because I just don't know. You know, I thought these were very different rocks to what they actually were when I got them. So I, on the last day, I... Uh, thought, well, I better get some specimens so I can sort of do a bit more research about the place and understand the geology a bit better. Uh, so I just went down on the map just here. It was not far from Kevin and Simone's residence, that area that's marked in red there. And I, I went into the understory of um, what is actually, you can see here, largely dominated by Eucalyptus grandis, which is a um, flooded gum that requires very deep fertile soils like rainforest does to, to flourish. And collected from the understory in there, all of these rainforest trees that were dominating the understory. Um, I got specimens of those. And then in the creek, I went and got um, uh, some geological specimens, sort of water-worn rocks, and just scooped up as many ones that I thought looked different as possible, threw them all into my suitcase, and they stayed in my suitcase for about four months. <laughs> I grabbed leaves, put them in there. I thought, I'll come back to these. And, you know, I, when I sort of finally got the specimens out and tried to identify them. They were in a, not in a great state, you know, and I didn't get branch samples so you could sort of look at the leaf structure or anything. I just grabbed all the, the leaves. So um, I went to, it created a very difficult process of identifying what they were. I, I sent them to my brother, to my father, another botanist, Dave Fell, who um, worked on mapping the rainforest of Cape York Peninsula with my dad in the 90s, who's now in northern New South Wales. I sent them to him. They're all going, I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's almost impossible to say, but after about two or three months of going back and eliminating possibilities, I, we think we arrived at a pretty definitive set of ideas on these leaves. Um, the rocks were really interesting for me because the, the landscape, I'll sit back down, the landscape around is largely dominated by phyllite uh, geology, which is sort of a metamorphic uh, rock. Um, and it's, I think they call it the Kin Kin Beats. Uh, is sort of what it's often known as with, with phyllite. And up this creek walk here, it was nearly all phyllite. You can see those sedimented kind of warped layers from the metamorphism and the pressure of, you know, um, kind of geological activities over millions of years. And you see all the layers of sediment. It's quite a hard rock. And it's very similar to where I grew up in North Queensland. It was really redolent of that. And then, um, but this creek here, what was fascinating was that I was expecting that um, it would be a lot of the same sort of stuff. So I got the rocks, um, I, I photographed them, and I, um, I tried to ID them myself and without even cracking them open. I got most of them wrong. Um, so I um, then said, well, I better talk to my brother, who is, a, you know, who is a geologist primarily, and I cracked them all open, opened them up with numbers, and I sent it to him and said, can you, can you tell me what they are? And what was really interesting was the... Um, uh, how heterogeneous the actual geology is in many areas within this zone because the, the geological maps are about 1 is to 100,000 and it kind of more or less looks like it's all just phyllite. But all of these rocks here are essentially to do with um, primarily uh, marine subduction zones, so where continents are being pushed down, uh, continental plates are being pushed down. So these are, uh, a lot of these rocks are uh, orthoamphibolites or amphibolites, which are um, formed during those processes. Um, and also a greenstone here, which is a, a marine volcanic, which um, they, they form really rich soils when they weather, uh, really fertile soils, similar to basalt, not the same. I mean, greenstone does in particular because it is essentially a metamorphosed basalt. Um, so what was really fascinating was this whole section 
around here was, um, well, there were, there were meant to be a huge amount of uh, tall oricarias, uh, a really large amount of oricarias up here. But, you know, the richest rainforests would have likely been in the lowlands where there, there was a lot more alluvial sediment. But a lot of that sediment and the, um, the way that um, minerals would have, uh, a large portion would have come from these marine volcanics that were once, you know, on the edge of a continental shelf. But it was just, probably came from just up in this section of the creek, maybe up around here. So that there's very different geology, for instance, around here to what there is here. And maybe because there's been um, sort of rifts and um, sort of fissures that have opened up in the landscape that have revealed other layers of geology that have then influenced, of course, that the idea that, you know, nature is a sort of a kind of a, like a relational, uh, I think what Nate Wright calls it a relational and intensive field of life and non-life, um, which I found really interesting because you have the geology and the history of the landscape and the, the movement of the continent and tectonic processes all very much influence what actually ends up growing in a particular place. So that, that you know, yeah, it was a bit dizzying for me once I learned that. I'm just wondering, we might have to finish now. I'm going to get you to the airport. Yeah, that's true. It's a long way to walk. Yes. Um, has anyone else got any other questions at all? So um, feel free to have a look at yeah. the, um, the keys for the maps there. Um, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, interesting histories I, that I found interesting, particularly in relation to the, um, you know, the fact that a lot of these eucalypt forests were completely um, dominated by rainforest understories as early as when this surveyor's map was made, which to some extent would suggest um, there's um, the history of the disruption of indigenous land management has influenced that as well. Um, and, you know, what were novel ecosystems that were essentially, you know, really diligently and um, uh, kind of consistently maintained over many millennia were possibly in the process of pretty dramatic change by the time that this was actually, this map itself was produced, um, is something else that's really interesting. And it's been something that's been looked at on Kigari, the way in which the tall um, eucalypt forests are now transitioning to rainforest uh, all over the wet tropics. Um, so it's sort of something that the force of climate and the Holocene, you know, which made things warmer and wetter, is, you know, these novel ecosystems are now turning into other things and you know what we make of that will depend on a whole lot of different sort of histories and ideas about the landscape of course yeah i'd like to thank matthew for that um, the incredible knowledge that he has of the landscape that um, overwhelms me a little bit sometimes <laughs> and i couldn't go any further because it was like sheer rock trying to climb up to get past it so i haven't even been to that area that matthew talked about on the property. Um, I might what are you doing this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> I might better get down from the old forestry track going the other way. Even but, the dog tried. Yeah, even the dog could get up there. So. <laughs> anyway, but thank you very much, everyone. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thanks to, of course, Kevin and Simone for, um, for having me up and being such incredible hosts and such fine company. Uh, you know, Joe and Jenny and the rest of the team at the gallery for being you know, such yeah, wonderful facilitators and helpful and kind of supportive of the whole process of putting the show together for everybody. Um, yeah, it's been a, a, a really lovely visit and um, yeah, really glad to have had the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.